So if I could uh, just start off by introducing ourselves and then I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves. So um, I'm Julia Cumberledge and I'm chairing this review um, and Sir Cyril Chancellor is my vice chairman, he's on my left. Can I um, just say at this point, because it's a good time for me to say it, I am a non-executive uh, director of the Private Health Information Network and that needs to be declared. All right, thanks very much indeed. Okay. Um, and Simon Whale is on my right, and Simon is the third member of the panel. And on Simon's right is Valerie Brass, and Valerie is our secretary to the review. And on Cyril's left is um, uh, Sonia McLeod, who is our key researcher in this. So that's us. Um, I just uh, think it would be helpful if you could say who you are, and I know today that we do have um, an observer um, from one of you, and uh, welcome to you, thank you for coming, and there are other people in the room today who are just helping us uh, run this event. So um, perhaps we could just work along the line, is that right? Certainly. So, uh, good afternoon, I'm Matt James, I'm the Chief Executive of the Private Healthcare Information Network usually referred to as FIN. Um, we are an independent not-for-profit organisation holding a government mandate from the Competition and Markets Authority to collect and publish data in the private healthcare space across the UK. Thank you very much. Very succinct. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm Peter Walsh from uh, a charity called Action Against Medical Accidents, known for short as AVMA. Um, we are a UK-wide independent charity uh, we provide independent specialist advice and support to people when things go wrong in healthcare, uh, uh, explaining people's rights, um, helping them with investigations and whichever avenues they choose to pursue as a remedy for what they've experienced. And we work in partnership with the NHS and with private healthcare, with health professionals to seek to improve patient safety. Thank you very much indeed. And NHS Resolution. Hello, um, I, I'm John Mead. I'm Technical Claims Director of NHS Resolution. We're a special health authority operating a number of indemnity schemes on behalf of the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. Good afternoon, I'm Denise Chaffer. I'm Director of Safety and Learning at NHS Resolution. Um, I'm a midwife and I'm a nurse by background. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so I'm going to just um, ask any of you, um, are there any interests you need to declare? Uh, interests in terms of financial interests from other organisations or anything like that? All right, thank you. Um, so I would like to start uh, with you, Mr James. Um, as I understand it, and you've uh, explained it very succinctly, um, that certainly you are not working for the private sector in any way, except that you are collecting information and disseminating it. Um, one of the things that uh, I think has concerned us, or certainly concerned me, is that um, solely private work um, is not... Uh, well, the complaints are usually handled by the private provider, and I'm just wondering, private providers have their own policies when it concerns complaints and so on. And I'm just wondering, should there be a centralised complaints litigation handling for the private sector in the way that there is for the NHS? And I think the difficulty comes when the private sector is doing work, transfers to the NHS or vice versa. And there seems to be a bit of a lacuna there, and I don't know if you'd agree with that. Well, I should probably state initially that complaints handling is outside uh, the scope of FIN's remit, so it's not something with which we are directly involved, and there are some other organisations which I'm happy to signpost who should certainly be involved in giving evidence about complaints handling in the private sector. So I will speak sort of personally as to what I know happens um, from a number of years of working closely with the, the private healthcare sector. Essentially, my understanding is that complaints, as distinct from claims, are handled within each provider, certainly at first and second stage complaints, but that an independent organisation exists for handling third stage complaints, um, that to which most independent hospitals subscribe. 
and that, uh, that organisation is ISCAS, the Independent Sector Complaints Arbitration Service, who should probably be called to give evidence on this point. And they now work, I think, with one of the main dispute resolution organisations, I want to say is CES, CESR or something like that. CEDR. CEDR, thank you. Um, so uh, that, that's my main understanding of how, of how complaints is handled uh, in that sector. And there are different processes, of course, for claims, where, again, those are usually handled within uh, legal processes um, that are administered by the individual hospital providers. Right, okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I don't know if either you two groups, uh, whether you want to come in on this or we'll move on to another subject. Uh, I'd like to, Baroness Campbell, if I may. Uh, we have experience of advising, supporting people uh, with complaints both in the NHS and the private sector. Uh, and we do notice a very stark difference between them. Uh, patients in the private sector do not have the same rights uh, as NHS patients. For example, if you're an NHS patient, you have a statutory right uh, to a standardised complaints procedure. Um, and if you are not satisfied with that procedure, you have a statutory right to take your complaint to the Ombudsman. Uh, the arrangements that exist in the private sector are an attempt to uh, provide a, you know, a second stage review, but it's not in any way uh, uh, the same or even similar to the role of an ombudsman. Um, also people in the NHS have access to paid for uh, independent advocacy, uh, certainly in England uh, and in Wales uh, and in Scotland. And um, that doesn't exist in the private sector. So what we tend to find is that generally speaking, uh, people who've experienced problems, harm in the NHS get to find out about where they can get independent specialist help and advice. There are leaflets, there's posters, there are people whose job it is to signpost people. In the private sector, people are much less aware of their rights. They, you know, they, they don't have automatic rights to the independent complaints advocacy service. They often don't get told about us. Um, and so by the time people have got to us, they had a very, very difficult journey and gone to various places and been told, well, no, we can't help you. Um, and for years, um, we haven't been alone in calling for a, a single complaints procedure uh, for private and NHS. Um, and also um, improvements, whether it's a single agency, it's difficult in the private sector because you have lots and lots of autonomous organisations, of course. Um, but again, with um, NHS, say in England, we've got NHS resolution, you can get detailed statistics, you can get reports, analysis of what's going on in the private sector uh, and even with the um, primary care practitioners. It's, it's almost impossible to get any reliable data about what's going on, how many incidents have happened in which organisation um, and what's being done about it, what follow-up is taking place. Yes, so your solution then to this is? It would be a, um, uh, a complaints procedure that's common between the NHS and private, access to a statutory right to go to an ombudsman, funded uh, advice and information, independent advice and information for people in the private sector health system, uh, similar to that which is available in the NHS. Um, and some tightening up of the indemnity uh, arrangements. Um, a common problem we come across is this confusion about uh, who is liable if there is a liability issue. Um, you get uh, independent doctors working in uh, private institutions and you know, the, the private hospital will say, well, it's the consultant you need to sue. The consultant will be saying, it's the hospital you need to sue. If they've got a contract with the NHS, there can be arguments about whether this is an NHS indemnity or is it a private indemnity. So uh, it needs to be tidied up and regulated better. Right. Well, thank you very much. I'm not quite sure if this is really your field. Or well, it, it may be just worth adding that um, at NHS Resolution, we do provide CNST cover for some independent sector that are undertaking NHS work. 
that's commissioned. Mm. Um, so part of, kind of, and John will know more about detail about them myself, but the, um, in terms of the safety learning aspects of claims, we do produce um, what we call scorecards, which is giving back to organisations their own claims data, and that includes the independent sector that are in membership. Um, so we do do some work with the independent sector alongside the work we do with NHS organisations, um, particularly in the safety and learning space. Mm. I know you've made great strides in that, I think. So thank Mary, you. Can I just add a, a couple of observations which may be helpful, I think. The first is that the issues of indemnity uh, will be looked at, I understand, by the Bishop of Norwich's inquiry into the issues surrounding the case of Ian Patterson. Mm-hmm. So it may be relevant to have um, some, some cross cooperation uh, with that inquiry on, yeah. on the basis. The second, just to pick up on Peter's comments, is in common with our mandate from the Competition and Markets Authority. Um, the issue of private healthcare is one where people are both consumers and patients. And so, to the extent that protection exists in complaints, processes exist in private healthcare, they're possibly more oriented around a sort of consumer approach to protection than uh, in the NHS, where they're oriented around a sort of patient and, and medical approach to protection. And it's possibly worth considering how those two things overlap because. Mm-hmm unlike in the NHS, people also are consumers and have that commercial mm. uh, and financial aspect to consider as well. So in some ways, the, the, the process needs to be more than that in the NHS, but arguably uh, certainly not less. Mm. Right. Sorry, can I just mm. follow that? The interface is actually between privately funded care in a private provider unit mm. as opposed to NHS funded care in the private unit. So if you are an NHS funded Correct. patient in a private provider, you are following the complaints procedure, which is the NHS mandated one. That would be my understanding. So as far as the provider is concerned, they can end up, and the clinician working in both ends up dealing with two different complaints processes. That's how it works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Also, the, the indemnity, um, some private organisations use the CNST um, mm-hmm. under NHS resolution, but it's optional. Uh, uh, they can choose whether or not they join that scheme. So you can be an NHS patient uh, uh, in other words, private healthcare funded under contract uh, by the NHS, something goes wrong, and unlike any other normal NHS patient, you find yourself uh, having to sue an organisation that's using a completely different scheme uh, with different different cultures, different approach, different systems. Thank you. Can, can I just want to come on? Um, can I um, go back? I'm sorry to you, sure. uh, Mr. James. Um, you don't appear to be receiving all the data that's mandated by the Competition and Markets Authorities, uh, particularly on the adverse events data. Um, so, are you doing anything to sort of rectify that? Well, uh, I think it's fair to say that this is um, still a relatively young programme and that. Um, implementations on the scale of FIN uh, take a long time to get right and that we could undo an awful lot of potential for good by making small errors um, as to accuracy in the publication of uh, of adverse events uh, information. So we've essentially taken the approach uh, of working with with provider organisations, with the relevant authorities, with the medical professions to try to build momentum in the way that we uh, approach this uh, and to approach it responsibly. Now, that means that it's taking slightly longer than was originally envisaged by the CMA to bring into effect um, the uh, the reporting that is mandated, um, but I'm confident we'll get there. Certainly, Finn remains fully committed to fully realising the scope of the CMA's order, and the CMA remains fully committed to realising the scope of the CMA's order, but I think there's also a general recognition that you, you progress carefully. And that's that's particularly true uh, when it comes to information being reported about consultants, individual consultants. But I think it's also true for hospitals. So the first stage that we've looked at is really to gather information on activity and being able to count things. And I know that should be straightforward. It sounds straightforward. It's not entirely straightforward either in the NHS or in the private healthcare sector or certainly the interface between uh, where historically those two uh, payoff systems have used different methods of counting and we've had to really bring the entire private sector 
back into using the same basis of, of counting activity as the NHS. And it's essential that we've done that first because you have to know how many of things are happening before you can make any sort of intelligent uh, uh, comments or, or data about the rates of incidents. So we do receive adverse events data from a large number of the larger providers. What we haven't been able to do yet is necessarily take that through to the point of publication to have assured ourselves of the robustness of that data, but it will come. How long do you think that's going to take? Uh, we'll progress to publishing the first adverse events information later this year, um, and that will be some of the more straightforward adverse events for which it is not common to risk adjust um, the publication. So, for example, in never events, the never events within the NHS but tend to be reported as a bulk number or a number as a, as a rate. Uh, against uh, either a number of admissions or number of bed days or something similar, similarly for infections. So we'll be able to publish that data later this year for the majority, I think, of private uh, hospitals. Um, and then there's a, a range of complexity through the adverse events through to those which we've stated we will achieve and are putting an enormous amount of effort, not just internally to Finn and, and the other organisations, but now in uh, close cooperation with NHS Digital, NHS England, CQC and other parties under a broader programme called the Acute Stage Alignment Programme or ADAPT to bring to bear measures which simply could not have existed before and would not have existed without this programme which rely on close connection between the private data that we are marshalling and the existing NHS data particularly on unplanned admissions, unplanned transfers of care between hospitals and unexpected deaths. So there's an awful lot of complexity required to bring that information into existence. So that we've been working on it for five years, to be honest, but um, that will still take at least another two years to come to fruition to a publishable point. Right, thank you very much. Can, I, can I just ask a question, which is um, for all of you, I suppose, as, as the chair mentioned at the beginning, we've We've met many, many hundreds of people around the country who've been affected by the three interventions that are within, specifically within the scope of the review. One of the things they've uh, often said to us is that um, there's a there's a disconnect between the adverse event report and the, and the intervention itself. So someone may well report an adverse event, but it's not always accepted that it's linked to the specific intervention. Do you recognise that problem? And if so what's the solution to it, both in, in the NHS and in the private sector? Um, I, I would say it's enormously complicated. Um, Sorry, you'd say what? That is enormously complicated. So if we take something as simple as never events, um, I tend to propose a relatively um, hard-nosed view of it, which is that if it happened, it should be attributable both to the hospital and the consultant where it happened without necessarily attaching fault or blame, but simply as a matter of fact that there was an adverse event associated with an episode, and that that adverse event therefore was associated with the hospital and the consultants that provided the care. However, the history of reporting of incidents across healthcare, particularly in the NHS because that's where it has happened, rather than private healthcare where it hasn't historically, is that people can't divorce that from a notion or blame um, and legal liability and other factors. So there is extreme nervousness about the idea of any automatic association of that publication and the effect that it would have on reporting rates, honesty, transparency, disclosure, therefore the ability to manage uh, the issues within a hospital and at a clinical governance level and at a national level um, and how those things would affect. And that's, so that's one aspect of it. There are also um, issues around definition um, because it won't surprise anybody to know that there are many different definitions of any given type of adverse event uh, floating around the system and you pretty much have to pick one and, and go for it. Um, I think uh, there are complications around the way that patients and the public and the media will receive and interpret the publication of those uh, of, of information which in, in uh, as you might imagine, given the role that I've chosen to do, I'm a great advocate of transparency and getting the data out there. Um, but I also do recognise that uh, information put into the public domain is often not used responsibly or is easily misunderstood. 
Um, and I think there are a range of other complexities also, uh, you know, to consider um, and, and, and procedural factors. So, for example, in this review, you're looking at some very specific interventions and very specific adverse events that attach to those. Uh, Finn's work takes a much more general approach to adverse events because we're trying to cover all specialties, all interventions, um, 500 hospitals, 15,000 consultants, 20 different specialties, both surgical and medical, um, at least 11 different types of adverse events across those. It has to be a relatively generic approach. Now sometimes you will see the same answer from two different directions. So for example, a specific failure may lead later to a readmission to a hospital. Clinically, and for the purposes of this review, you may want to consider the specific failure. FINS data would look at readmissions to hospitals and then ask what was the reason for that readmission. So you might get to the same answer but from two different directions. And again, that sort of complexity needs to be understood. So none of that is to say we shouldn't be doing it, none of it is to say it shouldn't be done. We are absolutely 100% uh, committed to getting through those issues and that's why we set up the organisation and are pursuing this course of action. But I do also recognise the complexity in it and I recognise the frustration that it would, would be experienced by patients because those things don't seem to be measured. Yeah, I think it often goes beyond frustration, it's desperation, because you know, the, the, if you take, as an example, we could apply this across each of the three interventions that we're specifically looking at, but if you take as an example um, surgical mesh, if a woman uh, reports um, severe chronic pain, abdominal pain following a mesh operation, we've certainly been told in many cases where that woman has been told, well it can't possibly be doing anything to do with the mesh that's been inserted in you, um, and it takes that woman months, sometimes years, before someone actually says, well, perhaps it is, and then then the story changes and mm. her, her experience changes, but it, the, 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 the emotional stress of going through that kind of journey is extraordinarily and, uh, difficult. I, I would recognise that completely, because I think um, in order for people to be able to recognise that the mesh may be associated with the chronic pain, there would need to have been a certain amount of data collected to say that mesh can be associated with chronic pain but there also needs to have been a process that comes before that that finds a way of recording chronic pain as a complication potentially of that kind of intervention yeah. and so there is a sort of a clinical and governance iteration that could take years frankly that we can imagine that following this review or as a result of things which we now know have happened um, people might be able to collect data in a way that could identify the same issue in the future. One of the problems I think we'll face is that there are a million different issues that could occur, and so you need a sort of corresponding number of processes to identify every possible thing in order to be able to catch things as they're happening or uh, prospectively, rather than simply after hundreds, you know, dozens or hundreds or thousands of patients have suffered adverse consequences and things which weren't well understood and therefore weren't well measured. Uh, I, I mean, sorry. Do you well, want I was going to look at whether other witnesses wanted but to. Would, would, would any chess witnesses like to say? Uh, well, probably from a, a slightly different perspective, I think, in responding to um, my colleague, is the whole area around instant reporting and the reason for re instant reporting, particularly serious instance, is based on um, learning. So, you know, the actual national reporting learning system is, is what it is there for. Um, and so, therefore, we need clinicians to report and in that context. And I think some of the issues around the understanding about why it's so important to, A, report, secondly, to do that in partnership with families and involve them, um, is absolutely the philosophy of, of what we all need to be working towards. And that's certainly um, what NHS improvement safety teams um, view is, that's certainly what NHS resolutions view is, and I'm sure that's what my colleague in Admiral would be. Um, and I know we're talking about an ideal, but actually there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done around um, people being able to trust the system. And, um, you know, I think we have made significant progress. You know, there is a hugely improved reporting culture within particularly the acute NHS sector, less so in, in probably primary care at the moment. Um, and I think that's the way we need to work on 
the focus of the whole reason that we want people to report is so that we can learn and improve and take immediate action where it's needed. Um, and that's absolutely the philosophy that we are working with, certainly within my own team. We, we've been doing some workshops around in, improving understanding around what must happen at the point of incident, there, you know, the point of a moment an incident occurs, what is the support that should be put around that for families, whether it is around you know, media um, meetings, avoiding having people to go into some adversarial complaints processes, involvement in investigations and we've seen some gradual improvements but some of our most severe harm ends around maternity, the importance involving families through the investigation process and feeding back. And I think that has got to be the critical driver for driving reporting. And I think when it gets viewed in a negative way or a punitive way, it tends to just push reporting underground. And that's absolutely the reverse of what we need. And if I could just add to what Denise has just said, we've been on public record as an organisation since as long ago as 1998 to the effect that we will not withdraw cover from any of our members if they provide explanations to patients, if they apologise when things have gone wrong, you know, it's a duty of candour, um, we will not withdraw indemnity if our members do that. And, and hopefully that is an encouragement to the reporting that Denise has described. But they're still under reporting, would you say? Um, well, I, th I think, you know, it's the variation in reporting. I think that's absolutely uh, a fact. Um, I think organisations, the way they feel, I we often hear quoting that organisations are fearful of litigation. Actually, what we hear when we speak to frontline clinicians, they're fearful sometimes of their own organisation's response to the way in which incidents will be managed. And that is the area of learning that we're working probably most kind of hardest at. We, I brought with us actually, we've got um, our same sorry leaflet, which I'll leave you a copy. Um, so it's, it's absolutely in print that saying sorry is absolutely the right thing to do, um, you know, and it is what we would expect. And so I think our common messaging across all of the arms length bodies is the first point is, you know, openness, recognition, transparency, apologies, support for investigation. And we've got a journey to go on, although I think you know, we have made significant progress in some areas that, that we're getting much better at it, but there's a long way to go, as we've heard. Peter, do you want to add anything? I mean, I particularly want to ask, actually, about the duty of candour, which, of course, is a relatively new law, and whether that actually has increased some of the um, reporting or whether it has decreased it. On that specific question, uh, it's, it's too early to say, um, uh, but anecdotally, uh, the feedback I'm getting, I don't know if colleagues at NHS Resolution would um, corroborate this also, um, despite teething problems with its implementation, with uh, people understanding what has to be done and how to do it compassionately and well, um, by and large things have improved since the statutory duty was brought in in England people are having conversations with patients or their families that before the duty of candor came in simply wouldn't have happened um, or they're certainly having fuller conversations uh, than they would have done before this was brought in. Uh, it never was going to be an overnight fix but our perception is that it's begun to uh, change culture uh, and make the kind of openness and honesty that um, we and colleagues are espousing much, much more common than it used to be. However, uh, it's going to take time. It needs um, more than fine words. Uh, it needs proper regulation as well. So um, the CQC needs, for example, to be seen to be taking stern action against organisations who are not complying with this duty. So it's a sort of, uh, you know, uh, a carrot and a stick approach where, you know, it's, it's not all about threatening people. But it's demonstrating that it's not just a, a paper rule, it's going to uh, affect organisations if they don't comply with it, coupled with training, support and understanding that this approach is in everyone's interest, not just the patients, not just the family, but the individual health professionals and the NHS or private institution who are doing it. But um, in practice, it's still the case that an awful lot of people who come to us um, have not had that open approach 
Um, I mean, there's two kinds of uh, reporting, I suppose. It's the proactive uh, reporting that you can only do if you know about it anyway. You understand that something has gone wrong and you report it into the system for learning purposes. But even when uh, people present with an argument, a complaint, uh, a suggestion that their abdominal pain is due to something and other problems, all too often the response that the patients and families we speak to have initially is, is more often than not defensive. Um, you know, it's, it's first of all starting off on how can we make the case that this isn't due to anything that could have been avoided. Uh, rather than let's really get to the, bottom, to the bottom of this and find out what is the root cause. Not to blame or punish anybody, uh, but to give a proper explanation, a factual explanation to people, as well as show compassion um, and move on and learn. Can I now extend the conversation into system failures? Because we've met an awful lot of people who have uh, suffered in all three areas that we've been asked to consider. And one of the things we have learned is how long it has taken for <coughs> their problem to be actually recognised in the system. So one of our tasks is to consider how could that be better in the future. We're not blaming people. We just want to try and understand why it has taken so long for the problems of uh, women with epilepsy taking the bowel to be heard about what's happened to their children. Mm. The same problem mesh and Primadot. So, so what could we do as a system? And I mean, we, it's not, I'm not saying any of you are responsible for this. Mm. There are others who are going to see like regulators mm. and they're in the same business, but all of us together are in it and it's not working. Yeah. So what would you think we should be doing to try and make the system better? Shall I, who wants to go first? Shall I just finish off? Okay. okay, thank you. Um, I'd say there's, there's, you know, it's, it's not an easy question for any of us. We haven't got the complete answer, of course. My two t suggestions are one around culture. Uh, is you know We have begun that journey of mm. having a more open and honest culture. Mm. And it, when I say open and honest, I'm not suggesting that people are always being dishonest when they bat problems away. I think it's part of human nature not to want to believe that we've been harming people, not to want to countenance that, that lots of people have been harmed, who needn't have been harmed. And it's, it's overcoming that sort of culture by not having a, a blame-orientated approach, uh, by showing that people aren't going to be inappropriately hung out to dry as individuals. Um, so there's all that can be done around culture, uh, but also it's the regulation uh, and the robustness of investigatory procedures. And I think, again, we, there's light in the tunnel because we now have the Healthcare Safety Investigations Branch, a properly specialist, dedicated unit, albeit very limited in capacity, uh, who um, can look at issues uh, forensically and come up with learning points for the system. Um, if we can have much more of that, I mean, Denise mentioned that one of the weaknesses we all recognise that's been across the system is the quality of investigation. Um, it's been very, very inconsistent, to say the least, sometimes appallingly bad. Um, and anything that we can done, I, I think that in itself is the single biggest thing improving investigations um, in, when problems begin to get recognised that could help. Thank you. Um, I think what I would add, I mean, I, I agree with mm -hmm. what um, Peter said, is um, the fundamental issue there is, is around um, the clinical medical professions seeing families and patients as partners, and I think it starts with that relationship, is that people are equal partners in this journey and therefore they're entitled to adult level information that gives all of the risks and people can have those conversations and I think whilst I, and the same with the duty of candor we've got areas where there needs to be huge improvement we have got pockets of excellence as well around the country we have got organizations where 
you know, particularly um, they've been assessed as being well led. There are features of, of that that are shown in some of the CQC reports that show something's difference going on. So there are different types of relationships with patients. Um, and I'm talking specifically from a hospital point of view. I, I can't really speak with expertise around primary care, apart from my own personal experience clinically. Is that where partner, where patients are seen as partners, and the organisations focus is patient-centred, you tend to see that those kind of relationships um, around people being listened to and being heard and being met with when they've got concerns um, happens a lot more swiftly. And I think one of our, our biggest challenges, and certainly the work we see across the whole of England, is variation. You know, and what we found that does help um, is to encourage improvement by shining a light on what good looks like. And some of the conversations that people um, need confidence to have, the difficult conversations around explanations when things haven't gone well, staff need training and support of how to do that. Um, we've been providing some, having difficult conversation training, for example, in our maternity early notification scheme to help clinicians have those conversations. We have assumed that people are able and confident to do that, and that's a bit of a journey. But from our experience, we run a number of conferences around the country, and our, what's different and unique about our conferences is that we try and get where we see good practice, we get the organisations to present to each other. We avoid having keynote speakers and we get you know, an organisation that's really made progress in a particular area to share what it is that they've done. Um, we recently had a very successful conference on understanding consent and we had Nadine Montgomery speak and I think hearing the person behind that the whole piece of work around consent legislation from the heart saying why did that happen and what was the journey of that, that changed the views of people in that room and they went away and they, you know, their whole way in which they're going to practice and have relationships with families will change and so we can't change it all overnight but I think by shining a light on what good looks like it gives organisations confidence to, to see that they can do the same. Can I just ask, so okay we're all saying due to counselling you think it's made a difference, mm -hmm. you're saying you're doing education yeah. stuff, what's the follow up to actually make sure that things change? <coughs> well I, I think I mean, that's a really difficult question because that's a measurable question, isn't it? What's the impact of all of this? Um, I think what you see, I mean, there are some measurables where organisations are getting this right, you know, and, and I think, you know, going back to the well-led domain, that's one example of, um, you see um, the, the way in which an organisation is, is viewed by the users of it in a much more positive way, the way they can access the services, they can get hold of senior people. Um, one example is... There's, there's one trust that's been um, in the well-known domain who has a 24-7 email direct line to the senior executives if there's any kind of problem and they will commit to resolve that very quickly. So I, I think, you know, where, I mean, the, the problem with duty of candor is what we mustn't do is, you know, have a policy and miss the point. You know, the point isn't what level incident this was. This is what it's what would I want if I was a family member and something's gone wrong. You know, I don't want to say, does this meet the duty? Actually, every kind of area of um, care, if, you know, if somebody wants to have a discussion about that, it should apply across the board. Um, in terms of whether, you know, we're seeing progress in that, I. I it's impossible to say, but what we can say is that there are some organisations who are ahead of the game on this, and where that's happening, there are other measures externally to us where we're seeing improvements, and you know, particularly around the complaints side of it, unresolved complaints, and some of the the work um, that's been done with complaints in particular is one other measure is repeat complaints. So when a complaint's not been resolved, it comes back and comes back. Whereas actually, if you have a philosophy that the moment you have a complaint, you meet with someone face to face and you, you resolve the problem or aim to, um, it then avoids people getting into the adversary relationship and approaching um, Peter's organisation because of the frustration that they haven't been able to get an answer, which then goes further down the line is about the only way I'm going to get an answer here is to take a claim because I'm not feeling that I'm being listened to. So I think it's a complex question to answer, but I think it's upon all of us across the whole system, I think, um, 
the question was about system working, is how do we work collectively across all of the system, whether it's ourselves, NHS Improvement, Academic Health Science Networks, how do we do it with one purpose, which is actually to make it far more partnership for families and they're feeling equal parts. But I think you know, the question is how do we know that the interventions are actually working? Yeah, well, I, th I think, well, the only way you would know is, is the feedback that you get from families that use their services, you know, that they, they feel that they're open, they're accessible, they're listened to, and you're not having, a, if you start to analyse complaints, your complaints are not all in that space, you know, around feeling that they're not being listened to. Can I go back to this question of a system? Yeah. Uh, when things begin to go wrong, uh, it seems to take an awful long time before the system understands they're going wrong and can do something about it. Well, at least that, that's the experience mm -hmm. in these three areas that we've been hearing about. So is there not something where all of the people who are collecting information could actually uh, have a central intelligence unit that can bring together and go, you talked, Peter, about mm -hmm. the HSIB. Who decides what they're going to investigate? I mean, how do they know that? You know, and they're at the service with a memory and you know, going back 10 years and mm. so forth. Mm. Um, I think the short answer to that is they do. You know, they're, they're, they're very um, um, clear that they're completely independent and they will identify yeah, but how do they? How do they get to know that there's something to investigate? No, it don't. seems to take an awful lot of time before the people suffering terrible pain because of mesh had their voice heard, or the, yeah. the mothers with children affected by Valparate had their voice heard. Yes. Yeah. Primados likewise. Yeah. Um, that, that resonates with our experience of dealing with the families and the patients as well, but um, I, I also really echo um, and understand Sonia's point that um, even, even if there's recognition that something's going wrong, and even if the investigation is exemplary um, and comes up with an action plan, uh, sometimes the action plan isn't implemented um, and you know there isn't a follow-up there isn't someone standing behind that action plan external saying has it been done you know we've had families who've gone back after a year after having been satisfied there's been a thorough investigation there, there is going to be learning it's going to be stopped from happening to someone else uh, and they find out but if you see a pattern think of people coming to you or to NHS resolution you see a pattern uh, of things coming your way, and you think, oh, that's uh, that seems to be a cluster. Where do you go immediately in the system to say, hey guys, you need to be thinking about this, and then they can use other intelligence and CQC or MHRA or wherever. How well, we we work? would go to NHS Improvement uh, and say, you know, this is a pattern we've we recognise it's far less likely on our numbers uh, that we, 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 we'd be sensitive enough to get those that uh, NHS resolution might. Um, but you know, the, the one part of the system problem I think you've identified, Cicero, is um, you know, it, it's the follow-up, it's the oversight. Okay, you've done a good investigation, you've got an action plan, A, have you done it, and B, is it working, or do we need to try something else? So, and that, so that's a bit of a missing cog in the system. So if you tell NHS Improvement that you're seeing a trend and that you're very concerned about it, what do they do? Um, I, I think what they do is that they take it into consideration along with all the other data that's coming into them. Um, so they, they certainly wouldn't jump because we reported a, a small cluster of um, things that we think is a pattern. But they would put it into their system uh, in the same way they do the, the other issues. And um, if I might say a good example of this is they do from time to time issue patient safety alerts. Uh, and often they're a, a, about uh, drugs, med medicines. Uh, and this has been happening for some time and it's, it's, it's really good that it happens. But studies we carried out a few years ago showed that the problem was, although the advice was good and been disseminated, um, there wasn't a follow-up to check that hospitals and other people were actually following the instructions that they'd been given. So again, it's that, that follow-up, that, that oversight. Um, I, I people are going to send it out and say, OK, so we can tick the box, it's done. It's disappointing that the system is not sensitive to these things that are coming forward, because if you 
The purpose of this review was set up. The terms of reference were agreed by the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State set it up because of all the political activity from members of Parliament and their constituents, and also the all-party parliamentary groups. And each of these three elements, Primadas, Sodium Valparate and Surgical Mesh, have a parliamentary group. Now, that is not a good way of actually finding out what's happening, what's going wrong, satisfaction for patients. I was very interested what you were saying um, about uh, places of excellence or really good places. And I'm just wondering, if you're seeing this good practice, what do you do with that? Do you disseminate it to others? Because we do know in the NHS there is often this sort of feeling not invented here. Yeah. And so we're not actually going to listen to that. But it seems to me a terrible pity if we've got gems, yeah. if we've got places of good practice, that that actually isn't disseminated while, uh, widely. So there's, there's a number of uh, approaches that, that we take. So um, what we are tend to do with kind of wider claims data is um, we look at it through a lens of high value or high volume and what might our action be in those areas. And we've appointed clinical fellows over the last two years to what we call deep dive for data and pull out and interpret that data and work across the system. So both our reports, the um, cerebral palsy report and more recently the learning from suicide report, is, is wider than NHS resolution, so it does work across a, n a number of other stakeholders that are in that space because one of the things we want to do in our organisation is give a unique contribution, not duplicate, um, and it does highlight best practice. So if you look at those reports, you can see areas of good practice. And then we, through our, our regional, local stakeholder events and, and conferences, we shine a light and give opportunities for people to speak on, on those areas. But I think in, in, in your wider conversation, I think around um, how does the system know and how do they communicate, um, it's always been a challenge around is, you know, is, is there a, a national database that we could put incidents, complaints and claims all in one place? And, and it's, it's possible and it's being worked on through, I mean, NHS probably to answer more around what they're doing with their new patient safety management information system going forward. The problem with claims is their time lag, to, you know, so it's, it's, it's also around, and, and also with the complaints through the Ombudsman, obviously they're very high level complaints, it's not everyday complaints, and how do you theme them? Our work has been much more at local level, so getting organisations that are looking at their own instance complaints and claims in the same space, because the contributing factors would be similar. So there's, there's local work and ownership to be done there, um, but NHS improvements National Patient Safety Team, it would obviously be better to speak to them than, than me. I can't really speak for them, but I have worked with them. Um, they do collect in, as you know, through the National Reporting Learning System, you know, clinical incidents that are reported on a daily basis. They do think them, they do look at the very rare national um, e events, they do produce safety alerts. From a, an organisation's point of view, and having worked in a number of trusts, there is a process within an organisation when you receive a safety alert, and you know the way in which it's distributed, and it is there are assurance processes. So American governments committees that review those and, and talk about the actions. The monitoring responsibility sits specifically with an organisation's own boards and governance boards, but also with the clinical commissioning groups. And so that is their role. In it. So all clinical commissioning groups will, through the contract, have regular meetings with their trusts, and would, they should be following up serious incident report action planning and overseeing. They certainly oversee never events in that way. So there, there are people in the system doing this, and I think very similar to how we spoke earlier, there's variation. You know, there are some places where that's being done in a very, you know, very sophisticated and advanced way, and others where there's a way to go. And one, one of the messages coming through from this is that there are there are several organisations, perhaps more than several organisations, who have a responsibility in this area, yeah. both within the NHS and separately, and in addition in the private healthcare sector. I mean, is that part of the problem that there's always overlap and or confusion about whose responsibility? patient safety ultimately is what we're talking about here and whose responsibility patient safety is 
And yeah, does, is the solution to that to create yet another body, which is the body responsible for patient safety? Um, well, I think it is one of those cases, patient safety is everyone's business, um, and, but it's, it's no one organisation's sole responsibility. I think the responsibility on, I speak for NHS Resolution, our responsibility is to work in partnership and alongside those other bodies for exactly the, the reasons that I've spoken about. Our examples of that are in the maternity space, particularly We've got a, um, a new initiative where we are receiving point of incidents around potential babies that may have potential brain injury, so we are knowing at the point they happen now, whereas in the past we wouldn't have known until we received a claim. And so we're able now to work with those bodies, CQC, NHS Improvement, NHS England, Royal Colleges, around things we're seeing that are happening this afternoon. So in the past we wouldn't have known. So I think there's progress being made, there's progress being made in learning from deaths and the inquest work which we've certainly been linked up with with AFMA. Um, so I think there has been huge progress. So it's not all, you know, I think there's, there, there are such a lot of areas we need to improve on and, and get the system working better together but I'm not sure it's because there's it's been clear that all of those organisations exactly what their role is and not taking away the absolute accountability responsibility for the individual organisations who are ultimately responsible for I mean, there's another, there's a, I get all that, and there's a, there's a, but there's a sort of another perspective to that. If you're, if you're the person who has suffered harm, yeah. is it clear, I mean, do you think it's sufficiently clear to, to an individual in that situation where they should go, who's responsible for helping them? Well, I think, I mean, the question, I suppose, the real test of that question is to ask the patient or the family. I and mean, when we ask people, yeah, so the we've, families, we've got a very clear yeah, answer from the people we Yeah, the families, you know, the first port call would be the organisation where this has occurred. Um, I think what they would then look to do is go to external bodies, you know, that, that may or if they've not had a good response from the organisation responsible, they'll go to other bodies. And I think that's where it becomes confusing for, for families. And I, I think, you know, clinicians themselves are also confused about the different bodies and the roles, particularly as there's quite a lot of change going on at the moment. It, it does make it much more difficult to navigate the system. But I think that's, you know, upon us all, our, our role is going back to partnership with patients is to help and signpost them, not to send them off somewhere else, you know, for people to hold the ring and try and resolve things for them instead of saying, oh, it's not my organisation going to talk to X. And certainly we don't do that. Um, we've had cases where we had people come to speak to us where it's not specific claim related, and we will pick up the phone and get somebody to support them rather than just say, oh, it's not us, go and talk to someone else. That's, mm. you know, I think that's all of our responsibilities to, to not do that. I have to say, in maternity services, um, <clears throat> we've had real pressure put on us from the clinicians to have a single portal yeah. because they are just fed up having to put in the same information to so many different bodies. It's inefficient, it's wearing, it's not good for the clinicians and it's not good for the patients. I mean, we would all agree with that and there's, there's kind of a, a shared ambition to resolve that. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I agree with Denise uh, in, in that patient safety is everybody's business, and it's really good to see the way that NHS resolution is evolving into being, you know, much more involved in patient safety rather than simply the claims handling side of things. Um, how and, and NHS resolution are also very good in terms of uh, telling members of the public uh, where they can go to for independent advice and help. So we get people coming to us because they've been told about us or found on NHS Resolution's website information about us. The duty of candour guidance for all registered organisations clearly says that those organisations should be telling people about us and other forms of independent advice and support. Now we, some of them do, uh, but we know that a huge number of them don't. Um, so in theory, everyone who's been part of a duty of candor process mm -hmm. should be handed some information about where they can go to get an independent view on what they've been told mm -hmm. and whether they need further help. Um, it isn't happening um, consistently. And so it, it, it's another example of um, things are moving in the right direction, uh, but they could move much, much faster and be much more consistent if there was a 
tougher requirement to follow um, the guidance and the, the systems that exist. Right, any questions? Um, Something we're going to do. Um, it was just one question, and that is that we have heard from an awful lot of people, a huge number, and yet in the evidence that you submitted to us in terms of how the mesh trends, I think you said you had 160. Now, compared to the hundreds of women we've heard from, that's a very, very small number. And there seems to be sort of a discrepancy there. I wonder if you'd like to elaborate a little bit more about it. Well, the, the 160 are, are, are the women who've actually made claims, um, and there are a lot of reasons why individuals choose not to make claims. Um, some of them don't want the hassle, some might not be able to get appropriate funding, some might not be able to find the right solicitor. Um, and litigation or making claims, certainly litigation, are very um, tiring and trying processes. Um, so many people who have potentially valid claims do not make them for one or other of those reasons and many others as well, I'm sure. Um, so um, I, I'm, I'm not surprised that, that we have a relatively small number of claims. Um, because that that is that is common across all types of claim, not just mesh. No, no, absolutely. I mean, love rate figures. I think we've had us to sort of up to twenty four thousand affected individuals, and thus far you've paid six claims, and the discrepancy is mm. huge. But what it does raise is the question: is if we are looking for mechanisms to detect class wide problems, those numbers don't seem to do it, so how do you do it? Perhaps you'd like to write to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, Valerie, well, just a specific, actually, if you think about the three interventions that we're looking at, predominantly they affect women and or their unborn children. And I'm wondering, given what you were just saying about the difficulties of going through litigation and what your experience might be, do you find that that's a, a problem for women who have gone through these experiences and actually they're less likely to bring the claims, they're less likely to seek the help than maybe others who've experienced an adverse event going through the health care system? It's just for that, that, that might be one that, that Peter would have better insight on than me, actually. Yeah, I have to say, uh, we haven't recognised that. Um, um, but it's perfectly possible. I suspect um, it's got something to do with uh, the complexity of the issues about um, it not being clear uh, that there is um, a, um, a winnable case, if you like, to take forward. But I think you also need to see this in the context of um, the numbers are surprisingly small. Um, it's already incredibly difficult for anyone uh, to bring a claim uh, against a healthcare organisation and it's going to become tougher. Uh, and unfortunately the government's position so far has been to say uh, we're going to make it even tougher. So even if you can identify a solicitor who now would be prepared to take you, your case on and try and get you justice, um, already we've had legal aid taken away. The only way you can go forward is you find someone prepared to do it on a so-called no-win, no-fee uh, basis. Um, and soon we're to have something called fixed legal costs, uh, which would put uh, you know, a, a limit on how much work lawyers could do on your behalf. So um, hypothetically, you could have an organisation that continued to defend um, up to the point where they know that people aren't going to be able to afford to take the case any further. Uh, so it would potentially take us back. I mean, the culture in this area has improved a lot over the years. Uh, it used to be literally a hard deny and defend culture. And that's begun to change for the reasons that we've, we've, we've heard. Um, but now with the financial constraints and the pointing finger of well, what's the bill for litigation, uh, it looks like easy pickings to say, well, look, let's, let's attack that area. But the 
one of the unintended consequences is that is one you don't get that learning because we, the system doesn't hear from those cases in the same numbers as one would if people could actually challenge an initial denial uh, uh, as to some extent people are able to now so it's bad for patient safety and also it would change the culture once again to incentivize a deny and defend approach because if you deny and defend long enough no one's going to be able to take you on. Well, I, if I could say uh, two things in response to that. First of all, the, the proposal, the government's proposals in relation to fixed recoverable <coughs> costs are only in relation to claims worth up to £25,000. Um, and secondly, uh, as Peter knows, we do not adopt a deny and defend approach. Um, we have a duty um, from the Department, from the Secretary of State, to pay justifiable claims, and that's what we always attempt to do. I wasn't suggesting NHS resolution mm -hmm. does, uh, John. What I'm saying is that inadvertently, or uh, an unintended consequence of the fixed cost regime, uh, might be that it would uh, have the effect of incentivising individual organisations to go back more to the deny and defend approach. And fixed costs are £25,000 at the moment, but many organisations, including yours, I think, have argued it should be much, much bigger and draw in many, many more serious claims. Um, and so, you know, it starts small, but beware, you know, those, those so-called sm small claims are very serious cases, some of them. We're talking about stillbirths, we're talking about deaths of old people. Um, and, and other fatalities and, and life-changing injuries. Um, uh, it's not always borne out by the size of the claim, how serious mm -hmm. the effect has been on people's lives. Oh, certainly, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. I can I just add something to that? I think it's worth um, noting we've recently commissioned um, some research about motivation to claim. I think it's worth, we could probably signpost you to that document, it's on our website. Mm -hmm. That was our, around low value claims, but um, some very interesting insights in that. So what we don't want to be in the place is where people are taking a claim because nobody will speak to them or give them an answer or an explanation. Where we are in the place is that people do fair compensation, that's the process, and there is, no, there is an NHS indemnity scheme for that purpose. And so some of this is around good signposting of, of families, you know, right <coughs> at the beginning, not go see a lawyer because they're going to listen to you, but actually you've got a case and this is the process. So there's something around all those conversations around that. And I think, you know, um, kind of in answer to some of the things you said, Peter, I think our example of what we do with early notification is the reverse of that. You know, so we're trying to meet with families very early, avoid them having to get into adversarial positions, admitting liability early, you know. So I think there is some progress to be made and we are we're on that journey. Um, and I think, you know, nothing is perfect yet, but I think there's a motivation to try and improve the system and you know, our organisation is, is very much behind fair compensation. I don't think I'm just questioning yours, but yeah. the trusts don't have to go to resolution, do they? Um, CNST is not compulsory, that is correct, but it's if every so trust, every no, trust in the country is a member. Yeah, they do, yeah. but what, I, I mean, I think there has to be a space to look and say, well, it is voluntary, it isn't mandatory, there is the option to step outside and do something else, mm -hmm. and there's a potential to consider that as well. I think it's unlikely, because let's be honest, you've had 100% of them for a very, very long time. Mm, 20 years. Mm. I'm, I'm going to draw this to a close now, but I'm going to ask my colleagues if there's anything finally they want to say, and then I'm going to ask you the same thing, if there's uh, a, a final thing you think we ought to uh, be discovering, thinking about in the course of the review. So, so I'm going to... Nothing. No. no. So, no. no. Valerie, no. no. Right, so it's over to you. Um, Matt, I do appreciate you've had to be quite uh, quiet on this, and, uh, but we did appreciate very much what you were saying at the beginning. Well, I think we, we have a second evidence session as well, mm -hmm. we're just speaking about data that can perhaps pick up on some issues there, but it struck me through that last conversation, starting with Cyril's original question about systems and improving the time, that we are at a point where we are still applying uh, 20th or even 19th century processes to um, to problems which arguably could be addressed in a different way these days if we can collect information, understand what that's telling us and react appropriately better. 
because the process of legal recourse via an individual taking action through a lawyer against an organisation has been part of English justice for hundreds of years. Um, and the process we've talked about about joined up information um, being available, again, as we started to explain earlier, rely on a certain iterative, very gradual, very slow building up of evidence. Now, I think some of those factors are addressable through better use of modern technology and better reporting if we choose to do so. And whilst we don't have time to get into it now, I will flag one counterpoint to that, which has been mass a massive inhibitor to us in our process of bringing better information forward that I would strongly encourage the panel to consider if you haven't done already, which is the, the factor of uh, how data privacy laws interplay with the desire to protect patient safety because I see those things operating in opposite directions uh, with massive in inhibition to proper authorities' ability to properly protect patient safety because information can't easily be moved around the system and analysed. And I know we don't have time to get into that now. I'd be happy to pick that up in, in the following session. But if we don't get time at that session, I would encourage the panel to look at it. Uh, there's always an opportunity for any of the panel um, opposite us here uh, to write to us um, if there's anything we feel we've missed or we ought to be exploring. But uh, Peter? There is one thing we haven't had a chance to discuss that I'd like to say. It's around the transparency uh, uh, about trials uh, and other information about drugs, medicines or uh, devices, uh, which at the moment doesn't have to be volunteered. So people you know, are able to choose the, the successful results and put them forward. They don't have to publish all of the information, all of the evidence that they hold. And that seems to me to be a very, very serious gap in the system that could be plugged. Yeah, I think when I was at St George's, it was called grey material. <laughs> Is that yes? Uh, um, nothing specifically for me, thank you. But we're, we're very happy to assist the in the panel in in any further thank way you. possible. Thank you very much. Um, yes. I'll just so I leave you. Um, I'll leave it. We've got our consent, and I'll, I'll say I'm sorry, leave it. Oh, thank so you. That might help you. I absolutely agree around the data sharing challenges, um, but I think there's huge motivation. The only thing I would add is. The um, NHS resolutions, predominantly CNST, covers secondary care, um, not primary care. So I think you know that's just to keep the context. That that's in, in terms of the way we've been speaking about. That's the, the trust that we have in membership are mm -hmm. predominantly in that space. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your time and the thought you've put into all of this. And we look forward to seeing some of you again. So thank you very much.